carta e validação das ruas da cidade. Né? E, então, assim, pesquisamos, procuramos os principais pontos de referência da cidade. Isso tudo para que esse banco de dados geográficos ele fosse utilizado no CISP, que é o Sistema de Integrado de Segurança Pública do Estado. Então, decorrer do tempo que o CIS foi implantado, né, após um mês ele ser implantado, essa... houve demandas de delegados, comandantes, né, de mapas impressos. Né. Chegava ao núcleo de processamento muitas demandas de mapas impressos, para que eles pudessem fazer suas análises, é, seus relatórios. Né. Então, assim, ou seja, fazer um refinamento do diagnóstico criminal. Então, assim, mas esse diagnóstico ele não estava completo, né? não existia a liberdade de análise, né? não existia aí a possibilidade, a prática, na realidade, da geocolaboração. E nós queremos mais com isso. Nós percebemos que, mesmo tendo todas as ocorrências georreferenciadas, qualquer natureza, roubo, furto, homicídio, nós queremos ter um ambiente que as pessoas pudessem, além de geocolaborar, integrar outras informações e traba também trabalhar com outros dados oriundos de outras secretarias. Nós queremos mais. E, e no ano passado, nós viemos apresentar exatamente sobre o CISP, que o Elcio acabou de falar, que é o Sistema Integrado de Segurança Pública. E conhecemos aqui a ferramenta do Arquidins Online. E pensamos que seria viável trabalhar com essa ferramenta e percebemos que seria um ambiente ideal para nós trabalharmos aquilo que nós estávamos almejando em nossa organização. Passamos a publicar vários mapas, mapas temáticos de manchas criminais georreferenciadas, através de contas temporárias. E percebemos que ficamos surpresos né, com a receptividade dos comandantes delegados e todo efetivo da segurança pública. Passaram a trabalhar, a compartilhar os mapas e também passaram a colaborar com outras informações. Tiveram iniciativas pontuais. Todas as semanas, no núcleo de geoprocessamento, recebemos... É, do soldado ao coronel, do investigador, do delegado de polícia, querendo trabalhar com geoprocessamento nessa ferramenta e também colaborar com outras ideias. Tivemos agora é, o georreferenciamento do disco de denúncia, o georreferenciamento das residências dos apenados em regime semiaberto, fechado, assim como também os mandados de prisão. Essas iniciativas também foram desencandeados projetos na Secretaria de Segurança Pública, como o projeto Escolas Seguras, em que as escolas municipais, é, municipais e estaduais, o próprio gestor da escola, ele podia editar no arquivo online, e assim o comandante e o delegado, em tempo real, ele podia visualizar aquela demanda que seria necessário um trabalho preventivo da polícia ou investigativo. Senhores, acredito que, tu, como todo mundo, como todo profissional do GIS, nós queremos chegar a um resultado com o nosso trabalho. É muito bom você ver o trabalho executado, as pessoas utilizando. Mas o mais importante de tudo é o legado social. O Ronda no Bairro é um programa que trouxe muitos resultados positivos. Eu vou citar apenas um dado para os senhores. A Zona Norte, que é a zona mais populosa da nossa cidade, e com o maior volume de ocorrências em quase todas as naturezas, nós conseguimos reduzir, em um dos meses, 57% dos homicídios da Zona Norte. Para quem trabalha com segurança pública, sabe o quanto é difícil reduzir 5% ou 10%. Imagina 57%. Além de outros dados, que nós estaremos falando mais sobre isso, né, na nossa apresentação, posteriormente, tivemos essa, é, é, esse, esse legado, esse legado social. Então, com o geoprocessamento, quem ganhou foi a população amazonense, que é o que é mais importante para nós. Obrigado. Obrigado. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you. Wow. As a geographer, I just, that, I don't know how that makes you feel, but that's, it's very humbling and it's very um, interesting to see how they've been able to use maps and geography to start to change the conversation. Integrating information and making it simpler for people to be able to make, use, and even discover maps. Now, 25 years ago when I started this journey with uh, GIS and with Esri, 
I, I, I guess it was a dream to be able to print that many maps off of a pen plotter at some point. And what I think is really interesting about this WebGIS pattern is that the pen plotter has finally been replaced by something that needs no pens and no ink. It's been replaced by the digital screen that's now within everybody's fingertips. And I think that's what's most exciting here. I can't think of anybody who's lost anymore because of a, a phone or a navigation device of some kind. And I really believe that what we're seeing is evidence that GIS has become that navigation device for the organization, now empowering everybody. Now, a little bit more about our work. I think the, the key thing here, I'm sorry, is that GIS is now accessible from any client. Really, whatever is at your fingertips. Think about it. It used to be that you had to go back and use your Unix workstation or your desktop PC. Now, actually, just like email. How many of you actually send or read or write emails from your phone or from your tablet? Anybody? I, I don't know about you, but I, I find myself reading and writing a lot more emails than I ever wanted to now that I have it in this device. There's some interesting patterns about how we now use email with these devices. When I send an email from this device, it's usually shorter and more to the point. When I write an email from my desk, it's usually longer. Some would say long-winded. That was a joke. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but it, it usually contains graphics, and it's a, it's a bigger, more rich document, has attachments. My staff and my colleagues know by the email that I send them what device I've used, actually. I think the same is going to be true of a map. I think there's going to be the need to use our desktops to author that authoritative information, to really do the workflows that are necessary to maintain the fundamental information that our, our whole organization relies on, the authoritative content that's at the heart of your work. But I also now believe more and more people will use their devices in the field. They will use their browsers at their desktop and they will use maps everywhere. Now, I'm noticing, I have to apologize, my slides were somehow garbled this morning, so bear with me. They're much prettier looking than, than what you see. But ArcGIS is still powered by services. Services now come from one of two places. They come from your GIS servers, those that you manage on premise, or those that you leverage from other organizations across Brazil or across the world. But now more and more, they're coming from the internet or from the cloud, hosted services. The commonality between both is they are maps and analytical services. They leverage standards. They le leverage standards of the web, restful endpoints, that make them easy to integrate with not just GIS applications, but all sorts of applications. Making that content more accessible, not just to humans, but also to other systems. Organizing, again, all that content is a thing we call the portal. The portal exists in the technology we call ArcGIS Online, and it also exists on your own premise when you deploy ArcGIS Server and portal for yourself. It is a way of being able to introduce a content management system to your organization, to inventory all of the spatial knowledge and make that more accessible and easier for people to find. I would suggest that now ArcGIS is a complete platform for bringing geography as a platform to your organization. Now, one of the things that we've worked very hard on at Esri in the past several years has been to amass a large library of global content that's ready to use for your work. No longer do you think about starting a mapping project with a blank canvas. You now start a map with a canvas of a base map. Those base maps come in a variety of 
flavors or styles. There are the basic underlying base maps that we use, such as topography or oceanographic or imagery or streets. But then on layered on top of that, we started to introduce demographic content for the world. So you can start to begin to analyze patterns and trends across the globe, comparing yourself to others to be able to do that kind of comparative analysis, which makes every organization more powerful. A benchmark of sorts. I was actually pleased to see this summer at our main user conference in San Diego, Rio de Janeiro, joining a family of other cities around the world, serving up information, comparing itself to other major cities, enabling everybody to understand the patterns and trends that make a city powerful and make it a great place for people to live and to work. I'm also proud, largely because my colleague and friend Jack Dangerman is a landscape architect, to say that we've invested quite a lot in generating what we call the landscape content series. Information that helps people make better planning decisions, factoring in both the built environment and the environment at large. I think this will have an impact on corporations who do business all over the globe. It'll have an impact on governments, enabling that kind of comparative analysis I talked about before, but also being able to contribute their information and make that information more accurate, more timely, and more available to the people around the earth who could use it. How many of you are desktop GIS users? I would imagine many of you. Well, we've invested quite a bit of time into making ArcGIS desktop better, stronger. We've listened to your feedback. I know many of you have actually submitted ideas on ideas.esri.com to be able to give us the things that critically tell us what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. That's resulted in many things. A couple of that I pointed out in terms of mapping, many improvements on the editing workflows, taking out some of the unnecessary dialogues and clicks that made your workflow have to go through extra steps. Generalization, an important cartographic idea for making very beautiful, very performant, multi-scale maps has been completely regentrified to make it scalable and faster, to be able to support different kinds of layers of information to make it look excellent. Also, much has been done in terms of analysis. Some of the new tools, my background in GIS and geography is analytics. I'm proud to say that many new tools have been introduced into the analytics line. But also, we've worked tried to uh, try to understand how people were using the tools, which options they were selecting, how they were using the different variations of the tools to analyze the information. And we've tried to make it a little bit easier to steer you through the options, to provide you with a starting point for launching your analysis if you're not a geospatial analysis expert. And then last but not least, in the area of security, I mentioned before, making identity a thing that's important to the ArcGIS user so that each of your individuals has their own identity and can therefore either limit or constrict or refine how the system capabilities and access to information can be actually provisioned by your administrator. Now, one of the things, oh, thank you. Oh, it's magic. That looks better now. Um, is that all desktop users will now receive a subscription to this technology we call ArcGIS Online. Now, that's actually a big deal. What that means is that if you're a desktop user, you now have an identity on ArcGIS Online. With that identity, you can save your maps and your information in such a way that you can now leverage it on your tablet and your smartphone. You now get all the capabilities of the base map of the content catalog that you can bring into your team, your department, or your whole organization. I think that's going to be pretty exciting and make it a bit easier 
for you to begin this WebGIS pattern in your organization. We've also worked quite extensively on the area of 3D. Admittedly, when people who are not GIS experts first look at a map, well, they're a bit challenged depending on the map. When they see it in 3D, it changes their perspective. It enables them to become a, a participant in that map. They can put themselves into different areas and actually see the world as they normally do in that third dimension. This is an area that I would encourage you, especially if you're in the government or in an engineering sector, to experiment with, to work on, and to use to communicate the power of maps and analytics. It's when we actually take advantage of these technologies that people of all education levels, all walks of life, really start to gain the power of what it means to make decisions using geography, considering geography. We've worked quite a bit on making ArcGIS a very powerful imagery platform. I know many of you have terabytes, petabytes of imagery information for your organization. ArcGIS provides a platform for organizing all that information and probably making a new sense of it, being able to see it over time, to be able to on the fly discern information hidden in your imagery, to be able to represent it in new ways to bring new value out of the pixels that your organization has collected in the past. I know several of you are ArcGIS server users, relying on it both to serve your information to the public at large, but also to drive the workflows in your own organization. We've continued to expand the power of the server. We've continued to make sure that it supports all of the essential open interoperability standards, that is open and interoperable with the other business systems in your organization, so that your IT department and other business stakeholders who run enterprise systems can integrate and leverage the maps and geographic information in your GIS. We've also now added something very special to the advanced server. We've added this thing that we call the portal, portal for ArcGIS. With Portal for ArcGIS and ArcGIS Server, your organization can have its own version of ArcGIS Online behind your own firewall. Meaning that if your organization does not want to leverage the cloud and they want to run their own infrastructure, with Server and Portal, you can do the same things that we do with ArcGIS Online. There's a new capability that we've released, and this is actually fairly exciting. It starts to get at the notion of real-time GIS. As you know, there are more sensors on this planet than there are people now. We are a culture of measuring things as humans. Everything, your phone, your watch, your TV. wind speed, precipitation, pressure, everything is being measured. Consider being able to plug all that information into your GIS to present not just a historical view of what that map was when you made it, but actually being able to click on a device and see its real-time perspective. That's what the GeoEvent processor delivers for your organization the ability to connect ArcGIS server with your sensors, whether they're on your vehicles, on your infrastructure, or on your people. I think by next year, you're gonna have some interesting use cases for how you're leveraging that technology. I had mentioned earlier, we showed a little bit of evidence. My colleagues, the rest of the morning will show you more. But we have really tried by hiring new people at Esri that we consider as um, creative, user experience experts, people who challenge us constantly to make the technology easier 
to eliminate button clicks, to change the iconography of the system. And as a result, I believe we now have a solution that anybody in your organization can leverage. I mentioned this earlier, ArcGIS Online. Our version of ArcGIS, our own technology, hosted in a cloud environment to make it easier and more accessible. We see that people use this who don't already have GIS technology in their organization to begin their journey faster, to reduce the time that it takes to get their GIS from idea to implementation. We've introduced web-based analytics to make it easier to be able to leverage the tools and powers of a GIS. We've geo-enabled business systems, as Anais had said earlier. One that I'm especially proud of is Microsoft Office. How many of you use Microsoft Office? Yeah, everybody. If you can make a chart in Microsoft Excel, you can now make a map for ArcGIS. Going right from a spreadsheet to a map with the simplicity and ease of making a chart. I think that is going to make it easier for people in your organization to participate in this new platform. A series of solution templates makes it easier to gain industry knowledge and leverage the good work of others around the planet who are doing the same kinds of work as you so that you can both leverage it and contribute to it. A set of solution products which you'll see when you walk outside that start to help you use the platform for your various areas of business. Our roadmap, my colleagues will talk about more. We will continue as a company to focus our energies on making ArcGIS a stronger, better, and easier to use platform to support your mission. But Esri is more than just the software. We have organizations inside of Esri that are focused on both supporting you on advancing the knowledge and experience of our youth across the globe as they experience maps and geography from an early age. We have a services group that's constantly involved in projects that are pushing the limits of our technology. All these things help us become a better organization or an organization fundamentally whose business is to focus on the approach that we call the geographic approach. Our partners help us be stronger. I know many of you are here today. We have a global partner community that extends our platform, helps you leverage that platform, and make your mission easier to accomplish, helping you solve tough problems and challenges. And last but not least, as I mentioned before, I humbly, representing all of my colleagues at Esri, want to thank you for being a user of our technology, being a member of our community, and for allowing us each day to support your mission. So with that, Aeneas. Obrigado, Chris. Bem, nós vimos então uh, como a plataforma está evoluindo. E uma parte importante dessa visão de como a plataforma vai suportar a automação dos fluxos de trabalho está nas informações. Até hoje temos falado muito das informações geográficas. Quando eu descrevi o globo que o sistema de informações geográficas considera, eu descrevi camadas de informação geográfica, mas também eu apontei esse globo como indexador de outras informações. É, Existem tipos de dados, o dado é a informação mais crua, e como esses dados vão ser tratados? Quando nós falamos na plataforma, suportando processos, suportando fluxos de trabalho, nós temos que preparar os dados, a gente tem que pensar em preparar. Porque nós estamos ingerindo na plataforma não só os dados geográficos e dados cadastrais, que tem natureza cartográfica, natureza geográfica, mas nós também estaremos ingerindo dados gerenciais, ou seja, dados dos sistemas de CRM, por exemplo, que é o sistema que cuida do fluxo de negócio da empresa, ou dados dos sistemas ERP, que são os sistemas que cuidam 
do back-office, das transações da empresa. Como é que eu vou puxar esses dados para dentro de uma referência geográfica? Nós temos que pensar também nos dados transacionais. O volume de ligações de uma torre, de uma ERB, o volume de transações bancárias numa determinada agência, como esses campos, qual a, como eu vou tratar esses dados para que eles possam ser consumidos no sistema de informações geográficas? Uh, aplicações de negócios são as aplicações que as empresas desenvolvem para os seus trabalhos, para os seus trabalhos em campo, para os seus levantamentos. E muitas vezes nós não estamos preparados para essa visão do dado corporativo. É, que podemos chamar aqui de governança. A governança, quando falamos de dados geográficos, ela já é representada pela IDE, que é a governança dos dados geográficos. Mas agora que nós falamos na integração de outros dados, isso se amplia. Nós temos que pensar em regras, regras para se criar os dados, é, esses dados devem ter um campo, eles acontecem em algum lugar. Quando alguém faz uma ligação, está em algum lugar, e a torre que faz a transmissão, está em algum lugar. Uma transação bancária é de uma conta, numa determinada agência, para uma outra conta, numa outra agência. Então, nós temos que pensar em como essa infraestrutura de dados das empresas, corporativos, ela tem que ser trabalhada previamente, trabalhada antes mesmo da gente começar a pensar na automatização dos fluxos de dados. Ah, as alçadas... Que, quem vai responder por esses dados? Quem vai colocar a informação do dado? Quem é o responsável por aquele dado? Então, são definições que, em uma IDE, são muito comuns, mas que agora nós temos que ampliar para outros dados. E mais uma questão é que, como nós vimos na apresentação do Cris, temos mais dados disponíveis na web. Não só dados geográficos, mas todo tipo de dado. Nós temos esforços de, que, de fazer com que esses dados sejam consumidos pelas organizações e sejam transformados em um motor da automação dos fluxos de trabalho. Nós estamos fazendo no Brasil também um trabalho para apoiar as empresas brasileiras que estão usando os, as plataformas, a plataforma ArcGIS, para a automa a automação dos seus fluxos de trabalho. E o Abimael, o professor Abimael, ele é o gerente da área de educação, é um especialista disso, é o gerente da área de educação da imagem, ele fará uma apresentação sobre essa questão. Bom dia a todos. Nós estamos pensando geografia, falando sobre geografia nesses dois dias, mas nós vivemos geografia diariamente. E esse é o nosso tema, e esse tema não é à toa, é o tema que nós realmente trazemos cada dia ao trabalharmos com os nossos mapas. Mas os nossos mapas são a linguagem da nossa geografia, ou do viver geografia. Mas, para criarmos os dados, para criarmos os mapas, esses mapas, esses dados que já foram registros em pedras, que já foram cartas náuticas nas grandes navegações, ou hoje, talvez, o um mapa que você fez o roteamento para chegar até aqui o evento, ou até mesmo para encontrar uh, como entrar no hotel. Né? Nós temos, então, dados e mapas, nós alcançamos o que nós chamamos de inteligência geográfica. E a inteligência geográfica apoiou um médico que muitos conhecem a história, né? colocado como o primeiro caso de geoprocessamento, Dr. John Snow. E lá em 1854, com três camadas, não foram aquelas infinidades que hoje a gente até se perde dentro do nosso sistema, com três camadas, mortes, poços e logradouros, Dr. John Snow e o reverendo Henry Whitehead conseguiram mudar a forma como nós entendemos o espaço urbano e o planejamento urbano. Ou seja, eles alcançaram a inteligência geográfica porque tinham dados, mapas e uma hipótese, uma ideia. E é isso que nós queremos transformar. Mas aí você me pergunta, mas eu não tenho dados, eu não tenho mapas, eu não consigo encontrar essas informações. É por isso que a imagem está trazendo para vocês, e esperamos a contribuição de todos nesse projeto, o projeto Geografia da Informação. Dentro...